Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Fireside Chat. I am the current CSI president. My name is Tommy Nelms. And we have our resident expert on with us again tonight, our director of education, Russ Demet. So, Russ, good to have you back, buddy. Well, it's great to be here. Well, uh, the, the topic we're going to talk about tonight is one that obviously is, is near and dear to me. Uh, it's a big driving force as to why we do what it is that we do. And we, we talk about it a lot. This is kind of, we're just going to add another layer onto the information that we're giving the homeowners. And, and tonight we're going to talk about chimney fires. Uh, what can happen, uh, what they are, what it means, and things that, um, that homeowners and their families um, should do in preparation uh, for that. And so, Russ, uh, how long have you been in the industry? Uh, 33 years now. 33 years. Yep. So you've, you've seen a lot of this. I have. And uh, my background uh, is in the fire service. I was a career firefighter for 11 years. Um, there's a lot of people in our industry that come from a fire service background. And um, it's interesting the things that you see. Uh, you know, Russ, we were, we were talking earlier before the show started and uh, to talk about some of the crazy things that we've seen. And, and when my wife and I started our business, I was still working at the fire department. And so I would, we worked 24 hours on, 48 hours off. And so I would uh, work at the fire department for 24 hours. And then on my days off, I would go and, and sweep chimneys. And uh, we made a run one night for a, a chimney fire. And it was actually a customer of, of ours. And he, this was after Christmas and he had cut up his Christmas tree and decided to burn his Christmas tree in his, in his fireplace. So we'll talk to, we'll talk about some no-nos uh, tonight, but that is, that is definitely one of those no-nos. Huge no-no. Yeah. So um, again, if you're tuning in or watching, please ask questions. Uh, we, we enjoy your comments. We enjoy your questions. Um, and we're here to answer those questions. Um, if you're watching this on a recording, you can always uh, reach out to CSIA. Uh, you can go to our website, csia.org, uh, or you can call our office. Uh, we have a staffed uh, tech center right outside of Indianapolis in Plainfield. And you can, you can even call and talk to Russ. You absolutely can. I talked to a homeowner today. Well, that's what yeah. we do. Part of our mission is not only educate professionals, but educate the homeowners of America. So we're happy to chat with you. Absolutely. Anything, anything and everything, fireplaces, um, you know, fire safety, um, you, you know, we, we can point you in the right direction, get you some education, give you some, some literature. And there's a tremendous amount of resources uh, on our website for homeowners to do that very thing. But um, fire prevention is a big thing for me, Russ. We've, we've known each other for a long time. And I always say, and this was ingrained in me at the fire department, that uh, fire prevention starts with education. Absolutely. Um, and that's one of the things that we stress a lot. Every class that we teach with the CSI is that our role as CSI certified chimney sweeps is to um, educate our customer, right? We, we want to go in there and educate them. I, I, I joke that um, there's not a man on planet earth that doesn't think that he can build a good fire uh, and most of them are, are wrong. Are absolutely wrong. And I think, I don't know how many times you've probably heard me say this in class, Tommy. We're in the business of putting fire in your living room. That's generally a bad idea. That That's exactly right. And I, uh, I'll share a personal story with you guys. So I got hired on uh, at the Franklin Fire Department in Franklin, Tennessee in uh, 2002. I was a young man. I had, I had just turned 22. I had an engineer, uh, his name was Steve Wells, and um, a great, great guy, great mentor to me. And I made the comment one time, you, you know, in the morning we would come in, we would uh, kind of do our, our handoff from the, the crew that we were relieving, check all of our equipment off, and then everybody would kind of, uh, you know, have a cup of coffee and we're kind of getting our day started, figuring out, hey, this is what training we're going to do and those sorts of things. And, uh, as, as a young man, I made a comment and uh, I said something about a good fire. Um, 
And, uh, and he looked at me and he slammed his hands on the table and he said, boy, there is no such thing as, as a good fire. And he just stormed off. And I'm like, man, you know, in, in every fire hall that you've ever been to, um, there'll be pictures on the walls, right, of, of major fires that have happened, you know. Um, and and they're, they're really good about kind of capturing that history because we don't, <laughs> we, we don't want history to repeat itself. Yeah. Um, and so a little bit later on, I let Steve cool off. I walked out there and I said, Steve, I said, man, you know, you're in these pictures. Um, you know, you've been to these fires. He said, I have. And I was. And uh, I said, well, well, you know, what are you talking about? And I'm, I'm a young guy. You know, I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll, adrenaline. And he told me, and I'll never forget it. It fundamentally changed me that, that day. He said, I've never been to a fire where somebody hasn't lost something that they could not replace, whether that's uh, a family heirloom, whether that's, you know, wedding photos, a family pet, or, you know, man, it could have been a loved one. And, and he told me, he said, you need to understand that your job is not to put the fire out. Your job is to prevent them from ever happening. And if you never go in to another burning building for the rest of your career, you will be the most successful fireman who's ever put on that uniform. He goes, and that's how you need to think. You need to make sure that they don't happen. And man, that was, that was such a, a, fundamental shift and because i thought you know there, there's this saying in the fire service you know we put the wet stuff on the red stuff and from that day forward um it changed and so i, I got more education focused and, and we want to prevent those things from ever happening to anybody and when i got involved with the csia uh it was quickly apparent that that is also the mission of the CSI. We do a lot of different things, a lot of, a lot of homeowner outreach. Um, you know, one of them being this right here. I know Russ is the director of education. Um, that's what you do day in and day out. You hit on it earlier. You said we educate the industry professional, and then we also educate the homeowner. So talk a little bit about that. Walk, walk me through a day in the life of Russ. Um, what, what sort of things are you doing, Russ, to help educate the homeowner how can you help them? Uh, what, what sort of information can you can you share with the folks that are watching? Yeah, on a typical day, I spend a good share of the day developing new programming uh, for folks we're not reaching. We do a lot of education for professionals, and then the professionals are the ones that educate the homeowners. Yeah. But we want to go more direct to homeowners. We're doing more and more of that. Just for example, we do a lot of training with home inspectors, the folks that inspect homes. And that's twofold. A uh, home inspector has to know a million things. Right. And it's not fair to expect them to know everything about everything. And our goal there is one of two things. That is, hey, we're going to tell you what you need to do to properly inspect the venting or chimney or appliance systems in the home. If you don't want to do that, you need to utilize the services of a certified sweep. So they'll come out and do that for you. Interestingly enough, we're getting more and more homeowners who actually come to our week-long training academy to learn what it's all about. Yeah. So we're making a lot of inroads there. And also a lot of home inspectors will now automatically say, Hey, you need to get a professional out here to look at your chimney. Cause it's not a simple thing. Right. Uh, That's Tom, exactly. you, know, you know, this, there's an unnumbered amount of innumerable amount of things you check. Uh, the national fire protection association talks about the need for an annual inspection. That's very important. And as part of that annual inspection, they list, a lot of different items need to be looked at. But then at the end, they say, this is not an all-inclusive list because every home's different. Every situation you run into is different. So it's important that they do that. Uh, today, I spent a good share of the day working on a presentation for folks who sell real estate so that they can walk into a home, not so they can be a professional, but they can walk into the home and see the red flags that are obvious uh, right away. So they can warn the homeowner, hey, you've got a potential problem here. Uh, I know you want to sell your home, but this is a this is a potential hazard. You need to deal with that. And it's just real superficial. Uh, that's the importance of those inspections. Uh, Tommy and I both know very well, but unfortunately, a lot of the chimney systems out there were not installed properly originally. Yeah. And it might not be a problem today. It might not be a problem tomorrow, but it's something you have to stay on top of. And by getting a professional inspector out there, 
they will oftentimes be able to run that stuff down before a huge problem develops. Absolutely. And that's, that's one thing that I think that, that is really, really important um, for, for the homeowner to understand is that um, I, we have uh, run across homeowners in the past that have said, well, uh, you know, it's been five years since I had my chimney swept. I didn't have any issues or it's been 10 years. Um, and, and, Everything can happen so fast. And I explain this to, to people this way. Every fire starts with one small spark, okay? Yep. And the problem is, is that in a lot of people in their mind, they think, well, if the flu is just going to burn, it's going to stay contained in that flu liner. Well, in a, in a flu fire uh, where the temperatures, when that, those, those, that creosote ignites, it can burn north of 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Absolutely, yep. So nothing um, is designed to sustain that amount of heat. And what, what happens is those liners will fail. And when that liner fails in the fire service, we call that extension. So the fire extends into other areas of the house. Or let's say you have a flu fire and the flames don't extend but the heat does, right? Russ, you talked about it earlier. There's a term called pyrolysis. Mm -hmm. And essentially what that means is it's the wood is drying. And when you dry wood through prolonged exposure to heat, you are lowering the ignition temperature. Exactly. Okay. Not to get too scientific, but Google that. Look up the definition of pyrolysis. Well, that heat hits that wood. Wood does not need direct flame impingement to ignite. It does not. And that, that wood will ignite. And then what happens is I've seen it too many times where that fire extends into an attic space. And by the time you realize what is happening, it's too late. Um, and, and that fire gets big. We're going to have a guest on this show, uh, hopefully soon. He's a friend of mine. I worked with him. I've known him for a long, long time. His name is Wiley Jones. I uh, worked with him at Franklin Fire Department. Uh, they had, uh, well, I was still working there at the time, a major fire in a neighborhood called West Haven. You can look at it on YouTube. Franklin Fire Department has a YouTube channel, and they did a documentary on it. That fire almost cost my friend his life. And two other individuals by the name of Tom Chaffin and Chris Bull. All three of those guys are, are fantastic guys, uh, great firemen, um, dedicated to their craft, love their families, and it could have been a tragic ending um, there. But that fire started in, in a chimney, and it extended into the attic space. And, and we'll have Wiley on here, like I said, and it's, it's a powerful story to hear from his perspective um, and to hear him kind of talk to you about what happened and, and the things that led up to that and, and what happened yeah. when Wiley got hurt. And, um, but those are the things we wanted to talk to you, uh, the homeowner tonight and, and have an understanding of this isn't to scare people. Not at all. Um, that's not the business that we're in. We're not trying to scare people. We're in the prevention business and we want to prevent things from happening through routine maintenance. And Russ, Russ just hit on it. And so that is that is routine inspections, annual inspections, and, and making sure you have a CSI certified sweep to come out there and answer those questions and educate you. Or call our office, shoot an email, reach out to the CSI, because that's what we're here for. We are a resource to the homeowner and to the industry professional. And that's, that's what we want to do. And um, so, Russ, let's talk about the things that you've seen, man. So being in the industry for 30 plus years, you've seen some crazy things. And I know that uh, you've seen some people <laughs> that have burned some pretty wild things in their fireplace. I have. Other other than Christmas trees, man. Talk talk about that because we, we, we talked about, you know, seasoned wood, dry wood, hardwoods. But a lot of people will think, well, you know, it's okay to burn a little bit of this or a little bit of that. So, um can you can you talk to that? Give us. I sure can. I sure can. One thing I want to uh, piggyback on what Tommy just said is, don't fall into the trap when a professional comes out and says, "Hey, this is a problem. You need to look at it. You need to get this rectified." Don't fall in the trap of saying, "Hey, it's been like that for twenty years. It's fine." Yeah. 
Yeah. Because Tommy mentioned the word pyrolysis. What that means is you're just this much closer to having a problem. Um, because that wood has, for lack of a better term, dried out. And pyrolysis is our friend because that's what makes wood burn. That's part of one of the four stages of, of fire. But it's not our friend when it's not contained. So that's right. Don't fall into that trap just because it's been like that and you haven't had a problem. You're never going to have a problem because it's not a problem until it is. Um, but yeah, things that I've seen people burn. Um, Christmas trees are one of the worst things you can burn in your fireplace. It's been sitting in your living room, and despite all the efforts you make to keep that tree watered, we all know they dry out and they start to turn brown. Yeah. Those are all a, a conifer of some kind. Um, hardwoods don't work well for a Christmas tree because the leaves aren't there and they don't they look kind of look like a bunch of sticks. Um, so these conifers are all contain a lot of resins and they get very dry. So if you throw those in your fireplace, they will ignite almost immediately immediately and you could actually say explosively. I was watching a video today on the National Fire Protection Association's website and they had a Christmas tree in one of their test labs that they hadn't had watered for however many days. And they put a small spark to that tree and it was literally a very tiny spark. And in less than 30 seconds, that tree was gone and the whole room was, a, was involved in a fire. That's how quick it happened. Uh, it, it's scary actually to watch. You put that in your fireplace. What happens is those flames start shooting up that chimney. If you have some creosote deposits in their flammable deposits, they're going to ignite. Yep. And the other thing is because of the resins, when that burns, it pops and cracks and everything else. And it will shoot sparks way out into your room. It's just a, it's a scary, scary thing. So you never want to do that. Yes. Yeah. It's terrifying. I know the video that you're, that you're talking about in, in that whole room um, becomes not to get super techie, but engulfed in flames in, yep. in, in seconds. Uh, yep. Cody Whitwood uh, just left us a comment. He said, love that you take care of the professionals and the homeowners. Man, that's our mission, uh, Cody. That, that is part of what the CSI was established to do. Uh, and we are, we are absolutely happy to do that. Um, it's something that we enjoy a lot. And, and I know that myself, uh, and I feel like I can speak for every CSI certified sweet man, woman, um, they're passionate about it, right? Um, they wouldn't take the steps to become CSI certified if they didn't believe in, in education uh, and prevention. And so that's that's one of the things that's big. You know, Russ, we talking about, um, you know, Christmas trees and things like that. It seems counterintuitive, but, um, you know, sometimes it's, uh, you know, a matter of convenience. And yep. people think, well, it's not that big of a deal. Um but it, it all happens so fast. And, and that's even with, you know, we've had customers that have burned railroad ties. I know you and I have, have had that conversation before or uh, throwing, you know, burning paperwork that they don't want anymore. And it floats up the chimney and, and causes problems. Or I even, I have a neighbor that lives down the road from me that has a wood stove. And, uh, you know, he used to light a flu fire to clean his chimney every year that he was like, that's how I clean my chimney. I just light it on fire. I get it cherry red uh, from top to bottom. And that I had to educate him. I'm like, dude, that is a terrible idea. Horrible. Uh, it is only a matter of time before you burn your entire house down by doing something like that. And it is just not worth it. Uh, and so those are the things that we, we wanted to push tonight. And, and uh, when, when Russ and I were laying this out, uh, there was a couple of things that I wanted to, really hammer home and that's coming from my fire department background we had an acronym it was called edith e-d-i-t-h and that stands for exit drills in the home um, i cannot stress enough for the homeowner to for you with your family with your significant other to practice exit drills in your house in the event that a fire occurs in your home you should have an exit plan Right. Um, my wife and I's bedroom is down the hall from both of my boys and their bedrooms. My kids know that if something happens, well, we always sleep with the bedroom doors closed. Start there. Keep your bedroom doors closed. 
have an exit drill where everybody knows, uh, you know, you're going to exit out of your window or however you feel your, your family comes up with a plan. And then you're going to have a meeting place. We have a tree out in our front yard. You're going to get to that tree and you are going to stay there. You do not go back inside. You do not do anything. You run to that tree and you stay there and you wait for mom and dad. Cause that's, if I can't get to you, that's where I want you to go. And it's very important. And I would encourage all of the homeowners to also uh, reach out to your local fire department because they're going to have education plans in place for you. Uh, get to know those folks. Uh, they're more than willing to help. I know in the community that I live in, in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, the fire prevention department there is absolutely first class. Um, they have so many materials. <laughs> Luke Hurley uh, left a great comment. Cleaning anything by lighting it on fire is a bad idea. <laughs> Lou, I completely yep. agree. Uh, but but it's out there, and that's what people are doing. And uh, yeah. it's, it's a sad thing. And then, Russ, the other thing we talked about was smoke detectors. Mm -hmm. um, every house needs smoke detectors in it. Every single house. Uh, early warnings are the best way to stay safe. Um, we don't want anything to go bad. Sometimes things happen and it goes bad. And make sure you have smoke detectors in your home, right? And I would also encourage the homeowner to reach out again to your local fire department. They, they may give them away for free. I know uh, in Franklin, we, we gave away uh, smoke detectors for free. And also carbon monoxide detectors. We talked about this a lot, Russ. Carbon monoxide is a byproduct of, of combustion. So when you are burning a fireplace, it is creating carbon monoxide. Yep. It's odorless, it's colorless, tasteless. And you need a carbon monoxide detector in your house. We don't even have gas appliances in our house but I still have carbon monoxide detectors. I do not have a gas appliance in my house and I have a carbon monoxide. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it's that important. And, and Russ, you could probably, you've probably got some stories where you could talk about, uh, you know, some carbon monoxide issues that you've seen over the years. What, what, what are your experiences with dealing with carbon monoxide and smoke detectors and things? Uh, like that? I had a good friend that almost lost his family because of carbon monoxide. And it doesn't take much. Uh, yeah. I live in the Midwest, and we sometimes get some really, really cold weather. And when it doesn't get above zero for 10 days, and I know Tommy loves cold weather, so he'd love to come here. Actually, I needle Tommy all the time about the weather. I'll send him a <laughs> picture of snow once in a while. Um, but it's very possible that your vent may be fine, but if you get snow and those kind of temperatures, it can still plug up. Uh, one thing a lot of people don't know is when you burn gas, well, any combustion produces water, but gas produces a lot of water. That's one of the byproducts of combustion. We don't think about it. But combustion is actually a chemical process. Yep. Uh, you produce about a gallon of water for every 100,000 BTUs you burn. If your vent is in a really cold location, it's very possible that that water will start to freeze when it hits the exit hood, and it can totally plug it off. So there's one great reason to have a carbon monoxide alarm. Um, one, Tommy, I, I want to expand on one thing. You said something about in the smoke from a fireplace, there's carbon monoxide. And that's absolutely true. But if you smell a little, and this is one of my, Tommy knows this is one of my pet peeves, is people say, oh, I love the smell of wood in my living room when I burn my fireplace. I got to tell you, people, that means your fireplace isn't working. You need to get a professional out there to look at it because a properly functioning wood stove or fireplace, you should never smell any smoke. Uh, there's a whole industry. Sometimes you'll see around the holidays is little logs you can burn in your fireplace, supposedly, that smell about, you know, have holiday smells or Kentucky Fried Chicken smells. <laughs> That's a bad idea. If you can smell that, that means you're getting carbon monoxide in your home. It's that simple. So if you get smoke coming out of your fireplace, your wood stove, you need to get a professional out there to look at that. Uh, it's not a simple thing to fix sometimes. Uh, right. We spend a lot of time at the Chimney Safety Institute of America teaching professionals how to diagnose those problems. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. But carbon monoxide, it, they call it the silent killer for a reason. Yes. And the, one of the things we deal with is typically it happens in the wintertime when it's colder outside and things like that. You're cooped up in the house. 
and the s early symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning mimic an influenza or just some kind of calm cold you get in the uh, in the winter. You know, headache, nausea, drowsiness. Uh, so be alert for those things. And there's a story, Tommy, that um, I had a, an individual who had a horrible winter. They said, every single weekend I'm sick. Yeah. But I feel okay during the week. Well, what happened is they had a problem with their heating and venting system. So when they were home all day over the weekends, all weekend, they were getting a, a level of carbon monoxide poisoning. When they go yeah. to back to work on Monday morning, they felt fine because they weren't experiencing those same fumes so and you, you don't know it it's colorless and odorless that's right and you know i mean i mean one of the first treatments for carbon monoxide poisoning is, is fresh air or, or oxygen um and that that makes a big difference and that's why you have to know if it's there or not is it right. present or not and if you if you're burning something in your house um uh, gas wood whatever it is um have a carbon monoxide detector. A lot of those detectors are dual detectors. Yep. Uh, and, and the technology has, has gotten so much better where, you know, they used to have to be hardwired or they would be, uh, you know, battery powered and you would, they, they didn't communicate with one another. All of the smoke detectors that we have in, in our house, they're all battery powered. Mm -hmm. We change the battery every time we change the clock and, and they all communicate with each other wirelessly, right? So if one goes off, they're all going off. Um, and, and that's, that's what I, that's fantastic. And the technology is, is out there to do that. And, and what people have got to understand is, is that fire is a wonderful, wonderful thing. We call this the fireside chat because people have been gathering around fires and having conversations for a long time. And it's, it's a wonderful place. Some of my greatest memories as a child were sitting around the fireplace, right? And in fact, when I was a little kid, uh, I ramped my favorite Hot Wheels car right into the fireplace and, and it melted. Uh, lesson learned. But uh, Nothing but dry seasoned wood in the fireplace, Tommy. I know. Well, I, I was I was a little boy and, and, you know, I was trying to be Evil Knievel and, and uh, you know, jump the Grand Canyon and it, and it didn't work. Um, but and we, we love fires, right? Everybody loves their fireplace. They love to gather around. It's a place where people congregate. It's a place where families get together. Um, but we also need to understand that, that there are certain responsibilities in that, uh, you know, responsibilities for the professional uh, to make sure that we are well-educated, that we understand what the, the changes are, what the current codes are. And, and what are the repercussions when, when we don't do things the way that we're supposed to, right? Or someone hasn't done something that they're yeah. supposed to. And then for the homeowner to understand that, um, you know, take it seriously. There are resources out there. There are CSI certified uh, chimney sweeps that are in your area. You can go to our website and locate them. Um, you can reach out to the CSI uh, tech center. We have a whole staff that, that is very well educated that can help you. But just to understand and to make you a little bit more comfortable with with what it is, I, I can remember when when I first got my driver's license and driving on the interstate was terrifying, right? Um, and I just wasn't really sure. You, you know, it takes a while to get comfortable with it, and 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 you understand to respect it, uh, to take the proper safety precautions. And same thing with the fireplace, right? We're not trying to give you all of this information to terrify you. We're giving you all of this information to empower you to understand that I can educate myself and, and train myself through either my local CSI certified suite, through the CSI website, through our YouTube channel, through this. We have a lot of different avenues to learn, reaching out to the staff at the tech center. And, and make you more comfortable with the proper operation, routine maintenance, and, and understanding the, the, the best practices uh, for using your fireplace. Uh, One thing, Tommy, that I don't think you even know you triggered in me is uh, a few fireside chats ago, you and John Caesar were talking, and you made the comment, they don't have fire or user manuals for fireplaces. 
Yeah. They're going to. That's one of the things I'm working on um, is a man, a fireplace manual. Here's how you operate it. And I'm sure you guys just said it in passing because this kind of stuff we say, but it's important to know how to use that thing. There are some do's and don'ts. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And, and there, there's, there's so many different things to understand and to learn. And, and we don't want to overwhelm it. And the whole reason why we started this entire fireside chat was, was so that the homeowners could have resources to come back to uh, where hopefully they could learn something. I know that if I don't know about something or if I'm trying to figure something out, the first thing I do is I, I'll go to YouTube and see if right. there's a video out there on it or uh, Facebook. And there may be a Facebook group or a Facebook page that, that addresses these very issues and, and just trying to educate myself. And it's been it's been a wonderful avenue to to learn. We want to provide that for the homeowner. And so that's that's what this is all about. So, Russ, before we sign off, what, what are some things, what are some final words that you'd like to tell the homeowner on this? Final words. Make sure you get your chimney and venting system inspected on a regular basis. The NFPA, National Fire Pick Association, says annually at the, at the minimum. Yeah. Uh, you're putting fire in your living room. That's generally a bad idea. So you want to be able to make sure that everything's as safe as it can possibly be. Absolutely. And you took that one from me, Russ, but I will tell you the couple of things just to reiterate. Exit drills in your home, practice with your family, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, get familiar with your uh, local fire department, whether that's a volunteer fire department or, or a municipality fire department. Doesn't matter. They're going to have fire prevention materials um, to help you get those, get those things in place. Uh, do it now. Uh, preparation is key. And for, for the professionals that are watching, I would say this, this is something that I tell our team often coming from the fire department and knowing that a lot of those men and women I'm, I'm still very good friends with, right? They're, they're, they're my friends. I know they I know them. I know their wives and husbands. I know their kids and they know mine. And so we, our mindset is we do our job so that the fire department doesn't have to do theirs. And that's exactly what we want. We want people to have uh, warmth and comfort in their home. And we want them to be able to enjoy their fireplace, their wood stove, their gas logs, whatever it may be, and and be able to enjoy it uh, regularly and have a, a resources in place for them to be able to do that in years to come. And that that's what we're about at the CSA. It's, it's what we do. It's our mission. And we thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, Again, like, share, send this out. Um, if you have any questions before we go, ask now. Um, if you're watching this after uh, on a recording, csia.org, you can go to our website. Uh, all of our contact information is on there. Reach out to us. That's what we're here to do. We are a nonprofit organization, uh, and we are here to help. That's our function. And we're here to educate. Absolutely. Yeah. It's Tommy wasn't kidding. It's it, it sounds corny, but it's kind of most of us mission in life. That's our mission in life. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Well, Russ, thank you again for your wisdom and your knowledge and your willingness to come on with us tonight. Uh, thank you for those that have watched and we will see you all in two weeks. All right, everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care.